Lovely. Okay. Well, enough of catching up. I think we're all done for the session. No, we're not. We're just beginning. Um, so those of you um, who don't know me, some of you will, maybe some of you won't. From, from last year, I did a session with James Otter. My name's Mark Shaler. Um, I... I'm an environmental designer, work on products, packaging, uh, a little bit of service model, um, craft, really important to me since I discovered through a really good late friend, um, EJ Osborne, spoon carving, completely changed my mind, not because I'm any good at it or I needed any more spoons, but because it made my life better. Because doing something with my hands had been missing for a long, long time. And I dare say we'll come on to that conversation today. Um, I, run a, I run a project called Reasons to be Cheerful, a not-for-profit project, where we kind of lift um, those voices that, of cheer a little bit higher. Uh, we do a free session every Monday morning called the Monday Communion. And, um, and I'm a founding partner of the Do Lectures. And that's where I met Sarah, who is our guest today. And I'm so excited to talk to Sarah because I bump into Sarah probably once every three years in different places we stay in touch really loosely on social media um, and, it, and it's always a joy so I met Sarah at the do lectures in Cardigan and we became mates and we met afterwards I think we met you know Sarah afterwards I think we met at the cafe are in where were we? we were in Soho somewhere well did we meet at the house of St Barnabas I forget I remember House of St Barnabas but I think I dragged you to Maze on Berto for cheap pastries and tea the place that smells curdled. Yes. So, so yeah. this is a cream cake shop at the bottom end of Greek Street. And yeah. it's been there. How long? How long has it been there? Like forever. Was... And it's run, run by a French couple who were so rude. I just love them for that. They're great. <laughs> yeah, but I, but, I, but I ground her down. I, uh, I ended up going there a lot. And then yeah. I, I grounded her down until she was nice. But what I, I love about... Down because I, I got a foot... Fo- Oh, Comely magazine wanted to photograph me, so I got them to do it in Maison Berto. Oh, so the, the owner, the lovely woman, suddenly went from being really grumpy with me to loving me, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> Strange what a bit of exposure does, isn't it? But what I love about that place is if anyone's been or hasn't been, it's worth going to. Um, upstairs are some, I'll call them art rooms. So um, they, they're permanent little art exhibitions. And from people who are nobody and just really, you know, love what they do, through to people like Noel Fielding, Mike, oh God, is Michael Elphick, did they have a session up there? There's some really interesting, um, I think, I think Jim Moir, Vic Reeves had a session up there. So there's some really interesting stuff that, that happens on, on Greek Street. Well worth, well worth a visit. Anyway, enough of that. Sarah, welcome. How are you? I'm all right, Mark. How are you? Um, do you know what? Considering I'm really well. Yeah, everything's great. It's a bit blowy. I live in Leicestershire. A little bit of a wind on. Um, it looks like it's going to be 23 degrees this Tuesday, followed by snow the following Tuesday, which I find utterly amazing. But I guess that is just March and April, isn't it? That's it's all over the shop. It's all well, over that and global warming as well, obviously. Yeah. Climate change is a massive issue for certain, and those extremes of, of, of weather are going to be with us for a long, long time. But yeah, I'm good. I'm all right, thank you. So you're sat in Haggerston. I am East London. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. But you're not from Haggerston, are you? No, I'm from Everton in Liverpool. West Everton, to be precise. <laughs> yeah. Does that, does that ever get short into to Weverton? No. Oh. No. But my just... accent's has a bit weird. I'm a bit Scouse, a bit Southern, a bit all over the shop. Yeah. No, I've I think been you're in London still... 12 years now, I think. You're still very Scouse, just so you you needn't worry. You I'm is. certain not you when I go to... when you go not home. Not when I get a taxi from Liverpool Lime Street Station to Everton and the taxi driver says, where are you from, love? And my heart just sinks. I'm like, are you taking me home? <laughs> so Everton, Liverpool, I mean, amazing city, genuinely one of my favourite cities, but I've only ever been as a, 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 as a, as a visitor. Um, growing up there, you grew up um, in a vicarage. Your dad was, was a vicar. He still is. He's in the he same vicarage. Yeah, he's got three more years and then he gets kicked out because you have to retire at 70. So he's still there working hard. What, what, what do old vicars do? They leave the parish out of respect for the new vicar. And 
I will, you know, it's so different. He loves his work. So he'll still probably do lots of community action and sermons. We're desperately trying to get him to write because he's really intelligent and really thoughtful. Um, so who knows? But he might just, I don't know, you know, you have those awful feelings, don't you, when people work so hard, even if you love it, and then they retire and they, they might just shut down. But who knows? But he's got three years left. But it, it, the interest, sir, I've got my head's full of questions about your dad. We're not here to talk about dad. He's um, interesting guy. Because <laughs> well, you get given a house for free to live in, right? So so you have no asset that's appreciating, right? So so is there like a is there like a retirement fund for vicars to be able to live somewhere? Well, vicars are on very low wages, but that's I also because you get free rent. If, you know, if my parents were very thoughtful with money and not giving it away to charity too much they do what lots of more sensible people would do and you know save money and buy a house separately or a holiday home or something but they're just workaholics and you know I don't know like lots of people not great with money but great in lots of other areas so yeah you don't do it for the money basically <laughs> No, I, can I can imagine, I can imagine that. But look, so, I mean, ha, ha, I want to talk to you about mum in a minute, but what was it like yeah. growing up in a vicarage? What was it like with church such a big part of, of your life? Yeah, I mean, it's different for everyone. My dad's Church of England, Vicar. Um, our church at home is a horrible 60s build and it looks like a donut. Um, so you've got the vicarage attached to the church, attached to the youth club, atta attached to this hostel that's not a homeless or halfway house but a hostel for people to come and volunteer for a year in the youth club and in the community so it's one building with a courtyard in the middle so and you're in the center of your area so West Everton for us which is an inner city area still one of the most deprived wards in the UK very high unemployment um health issues was lots of very bad housing in the 80s we've got better housing but still you know in a city deprived area with lots of inequality on your doorstep um and you're in the thick of it you know whether people are christian and coming to your church or not or not my dad wrote the local newspaper he still does film clubs for people to talk about things you know vicarages are normally a bit bigger because they expect you to have people around your house to you know sit in the living room and plan things and talk through things and my dad's really good at funerals so everyone books him up so he's always busy because <laughs> everyone wants him to do their family members funerals because he's really good at them so yeah it was just always on the go you don't really have that work-life balance of you know nine till five and you'd have the play scheme in the you know basically outside your your garden and um yeah summer fairs like as soon as you walked outside the house there'd be a summer fair every year you know i think yeah it was always always stuff going on i can imagine i can imagine and tell me about mum because your mum i mean i i've i've heard about your mum already and i think she <laughs> sounds amazing to me but you you tell me well, about they're both, yeah they're both amazing my dad's very quietly get stuff done and just is ridiculously quiet um but does loads and then my mum as a was a nurse and then a full-time mum of three kids under the age of five living on the 14th floor of a tower block on a low wage that she, she said nearly made her have a breakdown which I'm sure lots of you know people in the room will understand and then she became a local councillor, a local politician, because there wasn't anyone else who wanted to go up for it. And everyone in the community said, oh, Jane, you'd be really good at this. But she was quite shy, um, but really good at community development and thought, well, if no one else is up for it and no one else wants to do it, I think I could do a good job. So she became a councillor when I was 18. So the first time I could ever vote I had to vote for my bloody mother. I mean, I didn't have to vote for her, but you know, she was the best out of the bunch. Um, so it's a bit strange. And now, you know, she's amazing. She does loads locally, huge amount of casework. She was um, Liverpool City Council's Minister for Education and Young People, which was a big portfolio. And now she's mayoral lead for Better Business and Equality. And she does lots 
locally but also nationally and, and speaks a lot to me to you about inequality and what we can do on the ground and what government can do and she's a big politics geek um, and a bit of a workaholic and as everyone my parents have lots of flaws and lots of strengths we're all a messy bunch um, but they're yeah, both doing incredible work with the community locally and, and having ripple effects you know outside of it as well in, term, in terms of social justice. Oh, that's amazing. We'll come on. We'll come on to that in a minute. And look, our parents, um, our parents do the very best they can with the skills that they've got at the time. Yeah. And um, and there's a sell by date on blaming them for anything. You know, once you're <laughs> old enough, to, once you're old enough to pedal your own bike, that's it. You know, frankly. Yeah. Fr- fr- <laughs> frankly. But um, that sounds incredible. So so I've I've got this vision of you kind of growing up in this. You know, with these two these two kind of like huge north stars you've got you've got dad and and the church and you've got mum and social progression and cause related politics um and there's, there's you say you've got two two siblings yeah i've got a, a brother who's a year younger and a sister who's two years older so very close in age yeah amazing and so the middle child is the you know is the classic one that always feels forgotten i can't imagine you were ever forgotten sarah corbett were you <laughs> oh i was i mean i just loved doing my own thing so i probably was oblivious of whether i was forgotten or not because i'd love to sit in front of my mum's mirror on the landing and draw backwards looking through the mirror and my mum says when we'd have a babysitter she'd just put me in a pram looking out the window and say to the babysitter don't look in and then she won't notice we've gone because I was just and I still am a people watcher and I still you know as lots of people know I'm an introvert I just like doing my own thing so I was always in my own little head and my mum remembers once in nursery as um, you know, as the vicar's kids in an area where most of your family, generations of family live in the same area. And that wasn't the case for my mum and dad who aren't from Everton. And I remember in nursery, um, no, my mum said the nursery teacher called her up and said, you know, I need to speak to you about Sarah. And my mum, bless her, was like, oh my word, what's happened? Has she been bullied? Has she done something wrong? Like just thinks the worst as every mother does. And um, went in and the teacher was, you know, very serious and was like, so she she only paints in black. And I love painting and always have and drawing. She's like, she only she only goes for the black paint. She only paints in black. I was just wondering if, you know, she's doing all right. <laughs> so my mum was like, oh, my word, is she OK? And asked me as this little nursery school kid, you know, how's school and you know you you painting a lot and what are you painting can I see some of it my mum was like oh that's you know you say you're painting in black and I said oh and apparently I just said you know oh yeah you know everyone else wants the other colours I'm happy to paint in black and my mum suddenly was like she's all right (laughs) she just (laughs) lets all the other kids and I think some of it was being a bit scared of some of the other kids as well of like you can take the colours I'll just paint in black but I thought that was such a great story of you know you think got this little goth as a child and you know some of me is a little bit gothy but it was just I don't really care I'll paint in black it's fine <laughs> surely, surely there's a bit of goth that runs through us all surely even though oh, yeah. I'm stood here in a bright pink jumper there's a little bit of eyeliner we're black eyeliner pink. in me we're both in pink and we, we both went to, we went to drink at the same time and both raised a copper drinking vessel which is just the weirdest thing <laughs> the weirdest thing so look um sarah i could i can see this this um this amazing kind of like creative kid in this family that is you know genuinely quite different from the rest of where of where you are and drawn to do great good things how did you start in your career well number one there's an artistic thing straight off right i can feel i can feel that there's a craft thing even if it wasn't craft you weren't making stuff you were drawing that's there where did the activism side come from sarah well i think the activism was just osmosis i think you know being surrounded by it like i remember my parents like people we'd always have people in our back kitchen around the big table and in our living room and people talking about you know issues on the front doorstep around moldy houses and people getting ill around how we were one of the areas in the country that had the least amount of cars per head of the population people didn't really have cars but we but people would have to walk to the local supermarkets but there wasn't fresh fruit and vegetables 
but it was heavy to carry stuff if you didn't have a car. So there was, I remember just osmosis of learning, like, well, of course people are gonna eat smash instead of mash because it's lighter to carry, it's cheaper and it lasts longer. And so it take lots of boxes, but smash is also full of salt and not very good for you. And so I always knew, I was always listening around these, you know, systemic problems um, and inequality and prejudice and discrimination and people who had opportunities and people didn't and you know all of the messiness was what people would talk about in the area to try and solve and at the same time all of our images around the house were of Martin Luther King and Mandela and our mugs would be charity mugs every mug normally had like a anti-war slogan or a fair trade stamp or so it was just always there as whatever faith you are if you have any faith or no faith you're a global citizen we have impact on this planet we have impact with others what can you do to have a positive impact and and enjoy life at the same time it was you couldn't really ignore the injustice on your front doorstep but also the injustice in the world and when I was eight my dad only took one sabbatical Vickers are supposed to take a sabbatical every seven years he only took one in, in his whole career and he's got three years left and he hasn't planned a sabbatical um and we went to South Africa in 91 so Nelson Mandela wow. had just got out yeah. um I was eight and we went to see about peace and reconciliation that was happening there, specifically about what the churches were doing on the ground. Um, I grew up in a very white working class area, but we had to toxic riots and all of that happening as well. So my dad saw it as, you know, really beneficial for him to open his eyes and for us to open our eyes at what's happening elsewhere in the world, but also what are the parallels what are the things that we can learn from so it was just always part of discussion I mean I always joke that I feel like all we ever did was talk about religions and politics in a great way and we go see a film and then talk about how that links in with the world and it was just it never felt like a chore it, it felt you know like this is just part of the messy world we live in we're all connected and we should be thinking about how we treat other people and how we're treated and yeah it's just I like, normal. No, I, I, I like I like that. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm older than you. I'm 52, and um, and we had when my kids were kind of teenagers, um, what some of their friends would come for tea, and one of them said to Daisy, our eldest, that the next day or, or or after she, you know, when texted her when she'd gone, do your family always talk about politics? And she said, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what they do talk about, and um, and it's just. I, just having grown up with it my parents were exactly the same it was always it was always what what was what was discussed but growing up gr grown up inside a vicarage that's really interesting um did uh, when you were at school did, did any of this kind of campaigning and any of this kind of like social progression come with you into school were you able to to voice and mobilize some of these thoughts in your education well it's interesting because I, you know, growing up in the area, like I was also, me and my brother were like the only alternative kids in Everton, you know. Um, so we were a little bit bullied or we'd just stay indoors and listen to Nirvana and be a bit emo. And, um, and I remember when we got a skateboard to share and one of the local kids tried to steal it off us and they were a bit scary. So we just decided we'll stay indoors and try and learn to skateboard in the house, which if anyone tries, you know, house isn't that big so it's difficult to do so we were very my sister's very outgoing and had a good group of friends and it was it was tough for all the kids in our area so there was lots of issues people were struggling with um so I just stayed indoors a lot I was quite I know I didn't go to the local youth club because I again I was just quite scared um and so I never really did my own activism. I always dragged along to different campaign meetings and demos. And, you know, some of you have seen there's a picture of me, age three, squatting in social housing. Um, Cleo's nodding away at that one. Um, so I, I remember being part of lots of meetings and being taken to things, but I was so incredibly shy and liked being on my own that I never really put myself out there and as an introvert I was quite happy doing my own thing and then so the only thing my dad actually when I was in primary school said he remembers a kid a boy with a pink bag um and I think he came to help with the swimming classes 
and he heard, I didn't know he was there, but he heard me in the queue where I think his name was Stuart, who was getting bullied for having a pink bag. And he suddenly heard this little voice that was mine saying, I like his pink bag. I think it suits him. And then I just carried on doing something else. And my dad was like, she's so shy and she doesn't speak up. Like, that's interesting that she said that. And I sort of half remember it. But no, I never like led anything. And then in school when I was 16, so, you know, as an older person, I um, I was nominated by my peers to be head girl of the secondary school. And it was a girl's school. And I it was done in a weird way where you don't nominate yourself or people could, or you could be nominated. And I remember sitting on the bottom of my mum's mum and dad's bed one weekend saying, so I've been nominated by my peers to be head girl. I'm not the most popular person in the, you know, in the year, but people know I've got this weird background in politics and, you know, community action and, and speaking up for people when it's needed. And question things quietly if I didn't feel like it was just and people knew that and I was a bit of a geek and hard work and and I was nice to people and I said I don't want to do it I don't want to have to give speeches I don't want to just you know be the face of the school it all seems a bit shallow I'm not doing it for my UCAS form I don't really care about that and my mum was like but why do you not why do you, why are you still hesitant? And I was like, well, because I know I can chair meetings because I've been to so many and I had chaired some as a young person in our youth community action group. And I know that I'll, I'll wanna, you know, if, if kids think there's something they wanna change in the school, I think I could be quite helpful in that because I've learned from you guys in the community of how to make change happen. So they were like, well, why don't you go for it? You don't have to be loud. You don't have to, you know, do it the way everyone else has done it. So I did my little speech saying, you you know, to my peers, you all, you all know me and I'm a bit nervous to do it, but I know that if you've got issues, I'll try my hardest to, you know, speak on school council and speak to the staff and the governors and do what, you know, is helpful. And I was voted in. And then that's really when I only took initiative because I had this role and for years the students had wanted to wanted lockers in the school and some of the reason was because we all wanted to be American and have lockers like American kids on TV shows but there was also a genuine concern of carrying really heavy bags around people tripping up on bags all of that stuff so I asked the head teacher why we don't have lockers because every year the head girl asks for lockers and we don't get them and she said oh it's a health and safety issue and I thought, is it? We've got quite wide corridors and quite big classrooms, is it? I just had this feeling that it wasn't. So I spoke to the, the caretaker, who was this lovely guy, and said, Mr Gilbert, is that right? Is it a safety issue? And he said, I don't know, you know. So I said, well, how can we find out? So we measured all the rooms and the corridors downstairs, because it's the same every floor realized it wasn't a health and safety issue, put a plan together to say where the lockers could go. So it was, you know, about health and safety and presented it to, I, and then I didn't present it. I found out who was the most influential parent governor. Get, got, uh, spoke to the RE teacher who I knew really well and said, can I speak to this guy that you know? Can you give me his number as head girl? I would like to talk to him. I don't know where this came from, Mark and spoke to him on the phone and said, there's this concern about lockers. These are the reasons we want them. Me and Mr. Gilbert have done this plan. I'd quite like to get you on board to say you agree with it and maybe you could present it to the head teacher who scares me and intimidates me and is a bit, a bit against lockers. And he was like, this is a great plan. Let's talk about it. And we got lockers. And I just remember thinking, I didn't have to get people to sign a petition. We didn't have to have banners, which would have scared the crap out of me. We got these lockers in this very sneaky way. And actually before then, aged about 13, 14, I asked for recycling bins in the classrooms and we didn't get them because they said the kids would set fire to the paper. But I got them in reception and I got all of the, the reception staff to agree to have a recycling bin. And this was in the 90s, you know, about 97. So there was little, very like, quiet things like that, that at the time I didn't think were activism, 
but looking back was definitely like my sneaky way in but I'm still I was incredibly nervous and so I'm not I think maybe I should have done more activism as a child and I was just really shy and nervous and not wanting people's eyes on me and not wanting to fail and so I hadn't done as much as maybe think people might have thought I had. Sure but at the same time you know I mean I'm 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 an I'm an environmental consultant and use my kids are some of the worst recyclers I know, right? Because you have so much of it at home that you don't want to do it yourself. And if you've got that backdrop, that, that beautiful tapestry of activism and care behind you, then the, 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 maybe it's enough to go, well, yeah, they're doing, they're doing all the heavy lifting on that. But you described your approach to getting lockers as sneaky. I think it shows <laughs> phenomenal political maturity, age 16, right? I, and I, I'm, I'm left wondering, why you didn't go into politics. I'm left wondering why that wasn't appealing to you. Because I'd be awful at it. Because you've got to be, you've got, I mean, my mother is incredible at it because she's got to be five steps ahead of everyone else. Think what's the worst people can misinterpret her or reword what she says. And you've, you're always on the back foot a little bit. Like, and you've got to be good public speaker. I mean, I like, I'm loving having this chat with you and seeing people's faces, but I don't want to be in the public. You know, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be a politician. I, my mum would get these heavy brown envelopes in the post every week to read all these documents that she'd have to read to be able to scrutinise. That doesn't interest me. And I think <laughs> it's not where my skill set is. And then weirdly, because I am, you know, I do like creativity, but I'm more passionate about social change and gentle protest. I don't think that's the best use of my time and skill to be a politician, but I think other people are great at that. And actually I meet, sometimes I meet certain people, especially young people that I think, oh my word, you'd be an incredible politician. And I'll put them in touch with councillors or MPs or say, you know, what about joining your local party? Or, you know, I think they'll be a really good politician. I wouldn't be a good politician. I remember when I worked for DFID, the UK Department for International Development on a project for three years, and we had to get media training in the first month. And it was about, you know, what if people say, where's our taxpayer money going to? So we they had to film us answering difficult questions. And then we'd be like to learn if we were good at the media. And I'd be distracted by trying to answer the full questions from the presenter and not have my three points to power on. I'm just not a politician. I, it's not my skill set. My mum's brilliant at it. Others are great. But I, I don't think that's where I could be of best use on this planet. I think you're probably right. That's a great answer. And I'm, I'm really intrigued. So you left school at 18. Did you go to university? Was university on the cards for you? Yeah, yeah. I was lucky that my dad had gone to uni, so really encouraged it. My mum was a nurse before she became a politician. But most of my friends, it wasn't really seen as an option for them. I took a gap year because I didn't want to go straight to uni and I wanted to go live in the jungle for three months. So I saved up for nine months to do that, which was expensive, and then did that to, to do conservation work. And then I went to Manchester Uni and studied religions and theology, um, which is not about me trying to please my dad at all. If anything, I was like, why am I doing this? I don't want to go, you know, do what my parents want me to do which they never pressured us, but it was after 9-11 happened. I think I was in year 11, 9-11 happened. And I immediately thought, I don't know anything about Islam, about extremism, about different religions. And clearly religion and theology is such a huge part of our life, whether we like it or not in this world. I, um, I found out, yeah, this course in Manchester University, I wanted to go further away from Liverpool. I thought Manchester was too close. But it was this super cool course about what is religion, you know, what is a sacred space? Is it a football pitch now or a shopping centre more than a church or a mosque or a... So I, and I looked at liberation theology and Holocaust theology and absolutely loved it, but had no idea what I was going to do as a job. I mean, no idea at all. Um, I think the theology often gets a bad rap. rap. It's, it is... It's, it's philosophy, right? It's it philosophy is, yeah. and it's exactly. care. Um, I would have done anthropology if I knew what anthropology meant when I was looking at the UCAS <laughs> forms, but I didn't. And I wish I did anthropology, but in a way my course looked at 
philosophy, anthropology, psychology, sociology. Yeah, I was a big geek. I loved my course. And when did you first come across the idea of, or the notion, or the, the, the word craftivism? When did that first appear in your, in your rearview mirror? So this was, I can be specific on this one. It was 2000, it was the summer of 2008. And I was going to see my nan in Shetland and I had to get a five hour train journey to Glasgow, no, five hour train journey to Glasgow for work. And then I was gonna go see my nan after it in Shetland. And, um, and I picked up a cross stitch kit, little teddy kit to do on the train. Cause I was so exhausted in my job. And I joined lots of activist groups that I was like, I really care about these issues, but I don't know if they're doing the right activism. I don't know if their motive is pure or not so much or how effective they are. And I am, had no interest in craft at all. I quite liked some of the like feminism punk DIY craft like Bust magazine. So I picked up the cross stitch kits thinking, oh, that might be interesting. Um, but didn't realize like the, the benefits of what you said at the beginning of this, you know, using your hands, slowing down. And immediately it just clicked for me as, oh my word, the process of craft is incredibly therapeutic, good for my mental health. I, at the time I was really asking myself difficult questions about could I be an activist or am I gonna burn out? And do, can I not be an activist because I'm an introvert, because I don't wanna you know, perform? I was having a bit of a quarter life crisis about being an activist or not. And then I'd freak out and stop thinking about it and do something else. And the craft gave me this comforting thing to keep asking, to keep delving into those questions that were freaking me out because I had this soothing thing to do while my brain was freaking out. So I, I Googled craft and activism. Don't know why, but I thought maybe someone else sees the process as, as, as helpful. And the word existed and it was created in 2003 by Betsy Greer. But everything I saw was she's a knitter. So it was very much like knitting groups come together, make do and mend, talk about the personal. The personal is political, sometimes talking about the political. So there was this very, this word that existed, but it was a bit too broad of like, if you make anything, this will help your voice be heard. And I thought, where's the activism in here? And my activist head was, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What's the solution to it? Are you solving it? Whereas this was the craftivism out there I saw was much more about the personal is political, but there was nothing tangible. So I um, I contacted her and said, are there any groups to I could join, which there wasn't? Are there any projects I could do, which there wasn't? So I said, can I use the word and just try out stuff? Because I suddenly, literally on the train, had ideas to make my little mini banners and things like these little beauties. Doo -doo -doo. Um, suddenly had all these ideas of maybe we could do small stuff to engage people. And, and so she said I could use the word, but yeah, there wasn't anything out there. And then a year later, you no, know, a few months later, I found someone in Australia who was doing cross stitch on big grids um, in, in Melbourne. So we contact, contacted each other. Um, but it was yeah very much part of the knitting scene and yarn bombing obviously but there wasn't there wasn't stuff that i wanted that was very much like here's a social injustice here's the solution we want to implement here's how we engage power holders or the public or it wasn't as um maybe narrow focused or do you know what i mean it wasn't as explicitly activism as i wanted it to be so what was your vision for it? How, how, you know, because because I mean, I'm going to get you to talk us through some of the work that you've done very shortly. But um, some of the stuff that you've done is just it's beautiful, thought provoking, and it cuts through in a world that's noisy. Shouting louder isn't going to help. And you, and what I love about you, Sarah, is you like you just described with the campaign at school. You kind of go around the back. You go yeah. under the radar to get what you want. Tell me about your approach. Tell me what. Tell me about your vision for um, for craftivism. Well, I mean, at the beginning, I had no vision at all. I was just try I just had questions. I was just curious, and I just started testing stuff out. And I did some projects where we'd like 
people wanted to join in. So I started meeting people monthly in the British Library Cafe and then it got bigger. So we meet in the South Bank area for free on a Thursday, once on a Thursday every month. And I started creating projects because people wanted to do a new project every month and half of them were awful. And I just thought I'm wasting physical resources that could end up in a landfill. This isn't very strategic. So a lot of it's just been, you know, like any craft you learn from your mistakes and then you have another go. My vision now for craftivism, I, I mean, I didn't coin the word craftivism and I always say it's like punk music. You've got all these different bands and they wouldn't say their vision for punk is X. My vision for the craftivist collective is that I want us to, Okay, we've lost Sarah, I think. Give it a moment before she comes back. If not, she'll rejoin and, and I'll, I'll text her now. And dejoin. Everybody else moving okay? Can Karen Vine's moving? Yeah, okay, we've got connection. That's really good. Thank you. Let me just text Sarah. Um, lost you. Yeah. Uh, Okay, brilliant. Look, you know, um, this happens on Zoom. It happens on any, and anything, to be honest with you. And, and all we can do is keep chatting, right? So um, what I love about Sarah is this absolute um, certainty that she's got, that she's, that she's going in the right direction. And I, I guess many of you have seen her work, have bought her book. Her book is really worth buying. Um, and some of the stuff that she does is just so gentle and so subtle that, that you do wonder how it cuts through, but 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 it does. And I, I guess I guess there's that there is, as I said earlier, in a world that's kind of shouty and noisy, and there's too much, and it feels like there's just so much going on. That moment of pause and reflection can often be stirred by something really simple and really beautiful. And one of the things I want to ask her about in a minute, she's just gonna, she's just gonna join in a second. One of the things I want to ask her about in a minute is that whole idea of reflection and meditation. Here she comes. Um, that whole idea of reflection and meditation. And, and I think that really matters um, because it's really easy just to shout and to get nowhere, right? So I'm just gonna spotlight Sarah again. Um, boom, there you're back, hey. That's never happened in all of the many Zooms I've done. Sorry for that, don't know It's, a matter. it's fine, it's absolutely fine. Um, so, um, I was going to ask you, Sarah, and, and you leaving made me think about it. One of the things that I read or saw was a, was a, a comment you made <coughs> around, and you, and you alluded to it a second ago when you were on the train up to see your grandparents, but that, that, that moment where you realised that actually all of the doing in, in activism, all of the active in activism, it lacked a stop and a thoughtfulness and I'm going to call it a meditation, but you can call it call it call it what you what, what you will. Tell me about that realization and that and that the direction had to change. Yeah, I mean that was so. I joined lots of activist groups when I moved to London for my job because I was like, these are my people, and I cared about all these different issues. And you know, growing up. I was always, I could see that it wasn't just, you know, one media stunt that made a difference. It was all the behind the scenes work. You know, what I remember once in our back kitchen, people sitting there and swearing like troopers, you know, including my, my dad, the vicar and my mum, the politician, because they were campaigning. Um, what were they campaigning for? Something around housing and they'd been targeting the wrong person. And there was something, it was like they were targeting the housing officer, not the housing as so something else. It's very similar names. I remember being quite young when it happened, but similar names and them going, I can't believe we targeted the wrong person. We put all this energy into this person and they don't even have the power to make the decisions. So it was like, we've got to pivot, go for this person. And then another meeting where it was like, oh, we've got to find uh, someone outside the area to champion us in this, or we've got to get the House of Lords involved to try and get them to challenge the House of, 
uh, commons. And so I always knew that strategy was so, so important. And then when I joined lots of activist groups, I mean, I was part of Liverpool Friends of the Earth and we did lots of fun things and that was great. But when I joined them in London, people had these big grand plans of we're going to end, you know, we're going to end armament and we're going to drive a tank to, uh, you know, a big gun trade fair and I was thinking well hang on a minute how is riding a tank to close down an arms trade fair one it's unlikely you're going to close it down because there's one tank and lots of entrances and you're riding around in a tank that seems like you actually like tanks aren't you glamorizing tanks won't it look like you're advertising tanks I just kept asking really annoying questions and the group was just like well we have this tank and it's super cool. And I just thought, hang on a minute, you're doing this because you want to ride around in a tank. This isn't helping the campaign. And I spotted that in a lot of activist groups where it was, yes, we need to enjoy what we do, but the same thing about some of the performances. I, do, I always think of the opposite of if I'm against this campaign, how can I discredit it? How can I say, oh, there's no point in it? And I was concerned that a lot of activism was wrapped up in what people enjoy doing, which is why I always say craft is the tool, not the taskmaster, and it needs to serve your cause and not really be about you um, as much as possible. And I remember just thinking there's so much potential for activism to work. It does work, it can work. So it just, felt like people were either doing it, using it as an excuse to throw things at windows or to shout to people to make themselves feel better. Sometimes to be like, you're wrong and I'm right. And then you'd feel great. There wasn't that much humility in some of the more extrovert stuff. And there wasn't strategy when I was asking who were the power holders? What change do you want to make? Is that change realistic? What's the time frame? It was very, and then in the charity sector, I mean, I'm calling out the worst here. I do activism because it works and there's lots of great activists out there. But where I saw the, the flaws were also in the opposite of just telling people to sign a petition and just need numbers. And petitions are important. But I felt like we weren't having thoughtful conversations with people. We were treating them like clicktivists and slacktivists. So although we need, you know, big demonstrations, the loud stuff, and we need the petitions and we need lots of different forms of activism, I felt like no one was really offering a way to say, OK, we care deeply about these issues. We're really sad and we're really angry but we need to channel it into something thoughtful, strategic, compassionate and effective. There wasn't many things to help us channel that. It was just doing, doing, doing. And what I noticed with craft was it was this incredible tool to help me challenge, chal channel my anger and concern into me thinking more maturely and thoughtfully. And I thought, what an amazing tool to add to the activism toolkit, not to replace other forms of activism, but to, to say to people, you know, who won the, the race, it wasn't the hair, it was the tortoise. And I tell everyone to be the tortoise, to be more thoughtful and mature, because it's not only better for the activism, it's better for us with our sustainability as activists, with our mental health, to not either think we can save the world on our own or we can do nothing or we can't do anything, but to really say, okay, we should be angry about injustice, but if you only act through anger, you get chronic anger, which makes you ill. People are less likely to listen to you, even if they agree with you because they go into fight, flight or freeze mode. So I felt like a lot of activism was reactive of, I need to do something bleh, rather than, I need to do something, what's the problem? What's the solution? And working backwards. I always want us to work backwards rather than just react forwards, if that makes yeah. sense. And this is your, this is, this is the kind of very smart political mind of yours that is really important. And, and you're right. It's best, it's best used exactly where you are rather than in the houses of parliament. I, I, I can sense well, that. No, we need stuff in house of parliament as well. We need it everywhere. But I can sense, I can sense the, I mean, there's something really smart about spotting the ego in activism. I've been in those worlds and there is a lot of ego in activism and, and that's absolutely right. And there's too much and focus. I've on... been in some of mine, you know, I'll put my hands up, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep in check with my ego now. Hey, look, and, and uh, you know, being good at something and being egotistical are two very, very different things. But tell yeah. me about your, tell me about your top three activist or craftivist campaigns that you've been involved with or led 
Oh, but they're all my babies, Mark. That's a difficult one to do to say. Um, but they're all very different. I mean, I'm writing the handbook at the moment, which will be 20 projects, some new, some old. Um, and I've got some little examples here. So I love how different our hanky project is to our mini scrolls that you can see. So, you know, the hanky project where you make a handkerchief for a power holder to say, don't blow it, use your power for good. We know you've got a difficult job, but an incredible opportunity to make the world, you know, a happier, healthier, more harmonious place takes hours. You can see here, this took me about 10 hours to decide what to write, what to stitch. You got the messiness on the back. It's an investment to build a long term relationship with your MP or counsellor or someone who's high up in power that you can reach. And that's had huge effect from, you know, people might know about how Marks and Spencers decided to pay the living wage to 50,000 staff after we used our handkerchiefs to build a relationship with them. But also we've had a local primary school teacher made a beautiful handkerchief for their local conservative MP and got her and her primary school little kids to present the teacher with the handkerchief and then talk to them about how they wanted their juice boxes not to use, um, not to be juice boxes, but just cups and um and so she decided to help them reduce that with the local um, industry, the company that was using it. And then she said, she emailed the, the teacher saying, I love my handkerchief so much and I've decided to become part of the Conservative Committee on Climate Change because you and the kids have really inspired me. So little, little changes that are really direct, some more indirect, you know, the handkerchiefs I think can be an incredible investment for people. And then on the opposite side, we've got these little mini scrolls that take 15 minutes to write. So you write it in your neatest handwriting, you, have a lovely little ribbon on it. It's three messages that you pick which one resonates with you as the craftivist and you write it in your neatest handwriting and, and like cursive so it's super pretty. And then you shop drop them in little, um, in pockets in shops that you think could be more ethical or your friend's pockets or your colleague's pockets just to open up the you know help people be curious about what's the story behind the item of clothing and then it says at fashion rev at the bottom to find out all the different ways you can be part of the fashion revolution and that you know is very light touch and it's anonymous so you might not know the full impact you're having but i've done workshops in the barbican and all over the world in stockholm fashion week as well where the craftivists who've made them have said oh yikes this has made me think about being more curious curious about where my clothes are made or what I can do and then I've also had fashion journalists emailing me saying thank you so much for your positive press releases saying how we can be part of the solution and not just judging us or making us feel that we're you know we're bad for being part of the fashion industry and it got on the home page of the BBC News website which you'll know is one of the biggest in the world yeah. so that you know, for me, those two show the very different ways of doing craftivism, different objectives, different results, but just as important. And I think that's and what keeps me making them is that they do have impact. So that for me is really empowering and inspiring the fact that, you know, I picked turquoise, mauve and purple for the ribbon that you can see here is because it looks luxurious it feels more valuable when people find it you know we get people to write in fountain pen so that it's seen as quite like a lovely luxury thing like i love the fact that it's not string on cheap paper and it's turquoise not bright red or a neon color i love how you know aesthetics make such an impact um, but they make an impact to serve something bigger than ourselves. And, um, you know, we know from the World Health Organization that about well-being, you know, a third of our well-being health is contributing to society. So it's not contributing to society when I feel well and able to do it. Actually contributing to society, something bigger than yourself helps you feel well. And I think that's what I just think is in incredible about there's so many strengths of using craftivism but it's like anything you know craftivism you could I always say it's a bit like a chair you know you can make a really wobbly chair with splinters in it made in a sweatshop made out of resources that are unethical and harmful and toxic or you can make a chair that lasts forever that's really comfy that's super ethical and they're both chairs but I know which one I want to help make and sit on. 
and it's a bit like craftivism you know there's lots of different ways to do it but I think if we can focus on where we can be of use and make a difference in the world and help other people then that's the craftivism that I think has the most impact sometimes you know the impact sometimes you don't and I just want to say as well because I know we're coming to the end um my favorite quote that is definitely my quote it was my quote of last year that my my patrons will know from the yearbook is um by Maya Angelou and I'll probably get I'll paraphrase here probably but she says something about how people might forget what you've said or done but people will never forget how you made them feel even yeah. if it is anonymous with your scrolls and I think with activism that's often what we forget we forget how people are feeling through our actions and actually if we start with how do we want people to feel from what we do we want them to feel inspired empowered part of the solution so if we had that in mind, would our banners look different? Would our actions look different? Would our words be different? Would our aesthetics be different? Would the way we talk be different? Like, I think if you start from the other person, it actually really helps you serve the cause and not be worried that you might do something imperfect because it's not about you, it's about them. So it really takes the pressure off. It's true. And there's, there's so much, there's so much rich philosophy in, in how you approach these challenges and these problems and whether that be using craft as a way of bringing bringing some peace and calm and some meditation or whether that be in the in approaching people in a way that in creates engagement rather than this immediate arms up I, you're noisy and in my face and I'm not going to listen to you 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 open doors Sarah in a way that is really really beautiful truly beautiful um so there's been a couple of questions popped up um um and, and I guess it's one that I was going to ask, you know, how, how, how can you make a living from, how can you do this and make a living? Can you do this and make a living from doing this? And how did the Adopt a Craftivist campaign go? Yeah, it's, a, I mean, you can see I'm in my little flat here with my kits that I make and my books and things. I never planned on being a full time craftivist, you know, it very much happened organically. And I went part time in my job with Oxfam and then took the leap when I did a project for six months with Save the Children. And so, but, and it's really, I'm sure lots of people will hopefully resonate with this. I hate asking for money. I hate capitalist system in the world you know I need a bit of therapy I think about my relationship with money it just I wish it didn't exist and I could just get on with the work but it does um so it's really difficult and what's interesting in the last few years especially you know this February with the BBC um TV show on craftivism there's even even more interest and in people want to do craftivism and I think what's I actually feel like I'm I'm harming the craftivist collective at the moment and helping it because I do everything on my own from this little flat so that I can manage it. And I really need to build into a little team and that needs investment and funding. And um, But I think, if, yeah, I really want the craftivist collective to, you know, be this small team that helps more people. You know, I'd love a franchise where people have their craftivist aprons and bags on and go do workshops in people's homes like Avon ladies or men or different places so that's my you know one of my plans is how can I get to that point where it's not just me doing everything because it's actually stopping me having more impact because it is just me but the moment what's an incredible gift is these patrons so a few years ago I finished writing my how to be a craftivist book I left London because I knew I couldn't afford to write it and pay my rent so I, I basically sofa surfed for a year with people I knew so I could write the book and then when I came back to London just before I knew like oh my word I I don't how am I going to be able to do the important craftivism work I need to do that often isn't paid or isn't paid very well but where the most the most use I can have so I said to people like I really need to be on the living wage can you give me 10 pounds a month or 120 pounds at the beginning of the year so that I can have the living wage and really focus on doing what's the most helpful impactful work to do and not just what brings in the money um, and people know I say no to lots of corporates and expensive you know big paid jobs that I don't think are ethical so luckily I got just under 200 people, which is all I needed um, for the living wage. Now I need more because the 
the um, demand is more and I do want to have a, a team. But it was done in a way of like, you know, again, looking back at activists, Mark, you know, I remember thinking, how did Gan, you know, I don't compare myself to Gandhi and Martin Luther King, but how do these activists do the right work without having to just, you know, do all the money gigs? And they all had patrons. They had people who were like, I believe in what you do. Let me just cover your costs so that you can focus on the work. So I felt like there was a real tradition in activism to have patrons, which is why I still do it. And I do it. People know I'm not very good at newsletters. So I do. And I'm long term focused. I work year by year or longer. So I give a I do a magazine as a yearbook every year to say how you've helped with the Crafters Collective and helped with me with gentle protest. And it's an incredible gift. It's unconditional. People trust me to use their £10 a month, however, I think is most helpful. And then I explain it in the yearbook. So it's very transparent, but it's the only way I could do what I'm doing at the moment. And I definitely want a small team and I want to end up with that ethical franchise, which would be incredible. It's a great idea. I love the whole idea of a craftivist yeah. Avon person. We've got two quick <laughs> questions um, before we finish. Um, firstly, from Hannah, what are the best ways to involve others that don't think they're creative? Yes. Do you push the messages more than the technique or is it something different? And then the last one from Joe, can you tell us more about the climate campaign for this summer? And you've got about two minutes for both of those. I've got two minutes. So the first one is... There isn't one formula. We're all unique, complex human beings. So some people, you decide to speak to them about the cause and you say, here's a really important cause that you care about and here's one tool of how we're going to help reach the, the solution. And you go down that route. For some people who love craft, you say, oh, you're good at craft. Here's a great way to use it to serve a cause. And for someone who doesn't say they're creative, what I love about craft is that you it's a lot of just following the patterns and then you can be creative on top of it. So I didn't learn craft it. I learned to craft from YouTube. Um, so I make sure all my projects are always accessible to people who've never crafted before, but also people who've done lots of craft can embellish it. But I make sure that their love of craft isn't the taskmaster, it's the tool. So even if you can do a thousand French knots in a one of our hearts on your sleeves for climate change, it doesn't mean you have to do it because you need to be focused on what's going to help the cause and then in terms of what was the second question oh the climate Tell us more about the climate I, campaign I, I sneakily put it in the chat so i've got a project idea that i really want craftivists and crafts people to do this summer leading up to cop um cop 26 in november which d's nodding away at which is great I'm nervous to say it to you because I haven't planned the strategy fully yet. I have too many ideas and I need us to focus on where can we have the most impact. So here's some quick notes. You can see I'm scribbling away um, of what the idea is and where we can be a best use for it. And then obviously funding is an issue as well. So how can we do it um, with the adoption money and in a sustainable way? So I can't tell you what the project is yet, but my plan is, to, I've spoke to the Craft Council and Girl Guides about whether they're interested in it to support it, not financially, but for me to offer it to their guys. And my hope is that I can launch it the 1st of June, but I'll be in touch with you guys before the 1st of June to get some thoughts on. We might have like a Zoom chat about what you think might work for you guys. So I don't want to tell you anything yet because I'm still figuring it out, but I'm working hard on it and having lots of meetings. And I just think with COP coming up in the UK, this is our Make Poverty History moment again. This is where all eyes are on the UK. We need to show that everyone cares about climate change. So world leaders and business leaders go, oh my word, we can't ignore this. It's not just a certain type of person. You can see Lucy nodding away on that, which is great. So I think there's a real potential that in the summer, we can do loads to then get lots of media from September onwards and really complement what others are doing on climate. Um, so I'm dead excited about it, but I can't tell you the details yet. And we've run out of time, which is good. No, it's good. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, look, I'm, I'm doing some work on Regen Ag um, and COP. So maybe we, yeah. can, maybe we can hook up. And I'm just going to finish one question. Oh, it's actually just a statement. Um, this is from Dee. Um, she says, if you come into Scotland for the conference in November, she might be able to offer you a room to stay, Glasgow or Edinburgh. My, the, future of, the future is Dundee. Dundee is on fire at the moment. I know, um, I know it's not 
got a history of amazingness. But I'm a massive fan. Yeah. And then Glasgow, obviously. Um, well, Edinburgh's my nan's great. Glaswegian, so, you know. But Edinburgh's to... great, but it's where you take your parents, right? So um, I said the grandfather here. Right, OK, we're going to go. Sarah, the world would be shitter without you. So I can't you thank not. you enough for you being do. here. Thank you. And it'd be shitter without all these lovely people, Lucy, Dee, Fiona, Cleo, everyone here. Thanks so much for coming on our lovely Sunday chill out. Thank yeah, you. we've had a good turnout. Thank you all so much. Whatever you're crafting on, craft away. And um, and you can get in touch with Sarah. Um, what's the best way of getting in touch with you? Oh, you're there. Sarah at craftivist-collective.com. Yeah, and social media and keep an eye out. Yeah, do. I'm planning on the climate campaign from the 1st of June throughout the summer. So do like put something in your diary to make some time for some climate craftivism this summer, please, lovelies. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great last few hours of the Digital Craft Festival. It's a beautiful thing that's been created. And I just love the idea of us all being connected digitally and yet absolutely miles away. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. See you all love, later. Love, everyone. Speak soon. Bye.